Lindsay, can you hear me? We're live, Jim. Welcome, everybody. This is Kim Batterman, and I'm part of the Batterman Integrity Group, along with my husband, Brian. We are really excited to share with you what we call our real estate investment buy and hold. There are lots of ways to invest in real estate. This is just one, but it's an off opportunity to share uh, a few things that might be beneficial to you. Some of you are beginners. Some of you maybe have lots of experience in the investment world. Hopefully, we can provide some value to you either way. Lindsay is our executive assistant. She's gonna help us manage this webinar. Lindsay, you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, hi, I'm Lindsay with Kim and Brian's team. 
uh, the Batterman Integrity Group, and I am the Transaction Coordinator and Executive Assistant, and we'll be alerting them to any questions that you may have. So if you have a question, pop it into the chat, and I will pass that along, and they will answer it as soon as possible. So one more thing I just want to add quickly, um, and I see some hellos out there. Thank you, Tanner. <laughs> Um, I want to say to everyone, there's there may be clients online that have a realtor that work with our other partner realtors. We said to our, some of our other partner realtors, feel free to invite your guests, and they too will be on the on the webinar with us. But I just want to let you know that, um, of course, when we talk about getting together with your realtor, it's the realtor they invited you to the investment seminar. Thanks for being here. Hi, everybody. I'm Brian. And the uh, first thing I want to do is get rid of some of the uh, legal stuff out of the way. Uh, the Batterman Integrity Group is not a law or accounting firm, nor a substitute for an attorney's or accountant's advice. While we do provide some legal and tax related information, the information is general in nature and may not be specific or suitable to your individual situation. Nothing contained herein is intended to be or should be taken by you as legal, investment, financial or tax advice. The information and discussion in this presentation and or any related materials are based on the author's experience and research and are believed to be reliable and accurate, but not infallible. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with what we're gonna go through on this webinar tonight. Sure, I'm gonna go through the outline here with you. And in the beginning, it's gonna be a little more rigid. It would be the best way to describe it as we get into the first several bullets here. And then when we get towards the, um, you know, locating the properties, analyzing and purchasing them, we'll have a little bit, we'll have a little different flavor for you. So the investment objectives and our path of money is gonna be the first thing we're gonna talk about. And then what are the different types of real estate that we would consider real estate investments? And of course, there's thousands and thousands of them. We're focused on buy and hold residential properties in this, in this uh, webinar. And then the buy and hold investment financial terms. Um, what are some of the things we need to know? Uh, and what are some of the terms that we need to know? Market conditions that truly will affect the situation when we're in a seller's market versus a buyer's market or a neutral market, we're gonna behave very differently in each of those markets. And Brian will discuss that a little bit later. How to locate properties. There are multiple, a multitude of ways to do so. Um, we're going to talk about probably the best three uh, analyzing properties. Once we've identified that maybe we have three or four properties that are candidates, now how do we analyze to determine how do we dig deeper into this, into that particular property situation? How do we purchase the property? What are some of the tools we need? The, um, the benefits of using one tool over another tool, there'll be some conversation there. Then once, of course, we own it, we've got to lease it or we're not going to make any money, right? So we'll talk about how to do that. And we're going to give you some of the tools that we use and some others that we know are available on the market that'll help you out immensely. They're very inexpensive and very valuable. And then once you own it, are you going to manage it or are you going to have somebody else manage it? And what does that look like? Um, we'll, it will be about an hour for our presentation today. Feel free to ask questions. Like Lindsay said, if you have some questions, we'll be glad to um, answer those questions and we'll probably pick it up after the slide ends. So as the slide ends and someone, Brian and I switch off. So as we um, stop talking, we'll, we'll pull up a question from the chat and we'll answer that question. And then at the end, if you've got in general questions or something that's specific to you, or maybe you didn't understand something we talked about today, feel free to ask any question you want. Everybody can stay or everybody can leave, whatever feels good for you. Thanks for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Okay, so let's talk about uh, investment objectives. There's a number of reasons that people invest in real estate. Um, we're gonna focus on the assumption of positive return. So we're gonna invest in real estate in order to generate a positive return. Uh, the other investment objective is to build wealth. I mean, it's one of the biggest uh, opportunities that we have over 75% of the world's wealth is held within real estate. And so uh, investing in real estate is uh, objective to build wealth. And finally, invest in real estate to achieve financial independence. And we talk about having at least five streams of passive income. And this can certainly be one of them, uh, investment in real estate. And so what you want that to do is replace your active income. So if you're working in a, a job or you're, you're working at whatever you're doing to get paid, you want that passive income to replace that active work income. Then once that passive income exceeds your lifestyle expenses, you're essentially in a position where you can retire. And that's all what we really wanna do. 
Let me talk about the path of money. This was taken directly from the millionaire real estate investor by Gary Keller. If you look up at the top of the, of the chart there, you'll see there's two kinds of capital. There's the human capital. That's where we work and we get paid. Um, that's you know typical job W-2 type situation. Then there's capital assets. That's where we invest in certain things and it provides us a return. Both of those, the human capital and the capital assets provide us with cash flow. And with cash flow, we have four decisions on how we're going to use the cash. Today, we're going to focus on investing the cash. And when we focus on investing, there's two different types we can do. We can lend, and that's typically you put it into a money market or you, you know, give it to a bank, you earn interest, uh, buy stocks, REITs, mutual funds, those kind of things. So you're lending the money as an investment for a return, or the alternative is to own it, whereas you can own a business right, and generate a return or own real estate, which is what we're focused on here. And ultimately, we want that real estate to generate financial returns, which is the capital asset turning into cash flow, which we'll use for further investment. Lots and lots of real estate investment types. Most of us own a primary residence. Not everybody, but most of us own a primary residence. That's, of course, the first one. And why do we look at that as an investment? I've had a lot of people say, that's not an investment. That's where I need to live. Well, our intention typically is to improve our asset value. We want to make money when we sell the house, right? However, you do live there. You want it to make you happy. And so in some cases, we do things that maybe aren't going to give us the best return on our investment, but they make us happy while we're, while we're there. The second uh, bullet here is a secondary residence. That's more like a vacation home. For some people, they have two residents, but their second home is still going to be considered their second residence. You can't have two primary residents, right? So maybe you have a vacation home up north or a vacation home in Arizona, or maybe you live down south three months of the year and you live up here in Wisconsin the rest of the year. Flippable houses or houses that we're simply going to buy and hold for a short period of time Maybe there's something wrong with it. Maybe it needs an addition. Um, in some cases, they even move the whole house, right? But flipping typically is you buy a house, you refurbish it, and then you sell the house. And that definitely is an investment type. We see a lot of people doing that these days. Make sure you know your finances there. We also see a lot of people not making money <laughs> trying to do that. So you want to make sure you know how to do that well and that you have a system. Real estate investment trusts are another way to invest in real estate. That is a very passive way. You're actually putting the money in someone else's trust. You're giving them the money and letting them invest it. Large apartment complexes tend to be real estate investment trusts, and it's a good way to, to make money, make a reasonable return on that. Wholesaling is very popular today. People who actually don't maybe take ownership of the property, but they, they know of people who have an interest in selling and they have already pre-negotiated a particular price that they're gonna get for that property. Then they write up a contract that says they're going to purchase it, but they're not going to purchase the property until they found someone who's going to buy for even more than they've negotiated. And in most cases, if they own it at all, they only own it for the same day that they then resell it. In most cases today, we've the laws have loosened up a little bit. So we could find that next buyer and make the transaction. But in our contract, we've made it clear that the seller wants certain dollar value and whatever I get over that dollar value if I sell that property for them, that, that money in between is gonna be mine. They call that wholesaling. Lending, you can be the mortgagee. So you can be the person who has the, is holding the mortgage for somebody else. That's a great way to make money in, it, in the real estate environment. And then being a hard money investor. So we know lots of people who say, you know, I'm not gonna put my money in CDs. They don't make enough money for me. So um, I want to be able to loan money to people, especially flippers. Flippers use hard money a lot. Uh, I want to loan money to people, maybe pay two points up front, and I'll ask you for 10% interest, which is high, but it's a six-month loan, and you've already figured that into your ROI. And then there's the buy and hold strategy, where you purchase properties with the intention of leasing them out and making money over time, both on the property itself, on the asset appreciation, and on the rent, the cash flow on the rent. So as you can see, there's a whole bunch of different ways we can invest in real estate. And uh, tonight we're going to focus on the buy and hold, of course, and that breaks down uh, even further. We'll break uh, buy and hold into short-term, long-term, and medium-term rentals. And when we talk about short-term, you're most familiar with that for Airbnb, VRBO, those kind of things. Uh, when we look at the risk reward, in a short-term rental, you have higher risk. And, and I'll talk about higher risk in terms of occupancy. 
when we talked about the financial terms earlier, we said there's occupancy risk. So what is the risk of the, the property not being rented? So with a short-term rental, that occupancy risk is higher. But on the flip side, because you have the ability to, to charge more rent, you have higher reward. So it's a high risk, high reward. There's many different kinds of properties that fall into this type of uh, short-term rental. Medium term or midterm rentals, this has become sort of a thing lately, especially with the uh, real estate market the way it is with a lack of inventory that we have right now. Uh, when sellers put their home on the market, they relatively sell relatively quickly and sometimes they don't have a place to go. So we're seeing a, a surge of these midterm rentals where um, landlords are, are renting out for three or four or five months while the, while the seller sold their home, lives in this place till they find another one and close on a new property. Again, the risk reward there, it's medium risk because you have you know, less turnover of, of the, of the uh, rentals, but it's not as, uh, not as robust as a long-term rental in terms of a lease, a, a hard lease. But again, you can charge more for these midterm rentals. So the reward is a little bit better than the long-term rental as well. And then finally, we have long-term rentals, which is really uh, identified by having a lease, uh, at least a, a one-year lease or more. In a lot of cases, we're seeing two-year leases on the table now. These fall into categories of single-family, duplex, multi-unit apartments, this traditional renter that we get. The risk is low. The occupancy risk is low. We'll, we'll calculate that in when we do the pro forma a little bit later, and we'll show you that we use one month of occupancy risk uh, when we analyze our, our long-term rental properties. But on the other side of that, there's a lower reward. While we can get good rents, and Kim talked about how the rents have been, you know, you know we'll, we'll talk about how the rents are, have been high. Um, it's not as high as like something you get out of a short-term rental. So keep in mind, there's three different types. Uh, in this session tonight, we're going to focus on the long-term rental. Okay, so buy and hold financial terms. These are just all definitions, basically. When we talk about wealth, we're really talking about your net worth. And you hear people talk about building their wealth through real estate, acquiring, acquiring real estate. Um, all those ways that we can invest in real estate are all ways that we can build our net worth or build our wealth. It's your asset value minus whatever you owe, minus your debt. Uh oh, and that way of cash flow, here we go. Cash flow, there's positive and there's negative cash flow. And it's really positive if your revenue exceeds your expenses, right? If I'm making more money than I'm spending, it's positive. And if I'm, if I'm spending more than I'm making, my expenses exceed my revenue, then I have negative cash flow. Depreciation is something that a lot of times people don't take into consideration, but this is very helpful when owning investment properties. It's a deduction from your tax return. So it's you make money, but you don't have to, you don't have to um, be taxable on all of it. The state of Wisconsin allows you to take 3.636% per year for 27 and a half years as your depreciation. Now, something to keep in mind or a little note to make is it's on the building only. Depreciation doesn't, isn't part of the land. Only, only buildings are depreciable. And then we have appreciation. This is the increase in your asset value. And right now you're all seeing a pretty significant increase in your asset value, right? So if you own a home and you spend $200,000 on that home, last year in the Fox Cities, we made about 10%. We appreciated by about 10%. So in one year, your property went up to $220,000. That's $20,000 in increase in asset appreciation. Or when you sell it, it should be $20,000 more you can put in your pocket. And then there's EBITDA. And most people have heard of that term before, but not everybody really knows what it means. EBITDA is earnings before income tax depreciation and amortization, all right? Before, in, before taxes, before income taxes, before depreciation and amortization. So it's really your revenue minus your cost of goods sold and your expenses or your gross profit. Yeah, and EBITDA focuses on cash return. And that's what we're focused on here when we analyze our properties certainly the, uh, the depreciation and amortization will help us from a tax perspective. But when we're analyzing a, a property, we're really focused on the cash flow. All right, equity, that's the excess uh, market value to your debt obligation. So how much market value do you have minus the debt obligation? Then there's two components to that. There's the mortgage. As you pay your mortgage, you're paying down principal. So as you pay down principal uh, on that note, you're increasing equity by that amount. And then there's the appreciation of the property on the market value. So that's really a paper term because you won't assume that uh, equity position until you sell the property. But it's always a good idea to understand how much the market is appreciating 
so you can figure your equity, what it would be should you sell that property uh, right now. Occupancy risk, I've talked about this already, and this is really planning into the system how long you intend or expect your property to be vacant during the year, because that's certainly a cost to you because you're not getting rent during that time. So we'll show you how to do that. Pre-tax return on investment or ROI, that's really the measurement of the overall financial gain or loss or the increase in your or decrease in your wealth, right? Return on investment, think of it this way, you put a dollar in, how many dollars back are you going to get? All based on cash, not monkeying around with depreciation or amortization, all cash based. Note also that the taxes are very individual and specific. And so, you know, when you're getting ready to invest, you really need to sit down with your tax attorney or your CPA, your professionals in that realm and find out what the implication is going to be for your own personal situation because everyone's is different. Yeah, so let's talk about some buy and hold financial terms, other terms you're going to hear. Now, I want to preface that by telling you that these two pieces here that we're going to talk about are primarily focused on commercial. And the only reason we really bring it to the table is because you're gonna hear these terms and people wonder, well, what does that mean specifically, right? So I wanna make sure that, um, you know, that we're, we're gonna talk about this so that you understand what it is, but it's not something we're gonna focus on. Cash on cash return. It's the amount of cash flow gen generated relative to the amount of cash that you invested. And typically if you can make, I'm gonna say six to 10%, everywhere I've heard it's six to 10% is considered a good return capitalization rate, or you hear people call it the cap rate. That's usually what the, the uh, term that you hear. It's the ratio of EBITDA. So it's the ratio of that gross profit to your current market value, right? And generally four to 10%. So there's a bigger spread there is con considered a good return. And again, neither of these measurements consider equity or appreciation, which are very important in residential real estate. And they're generally used for dissimilar properties and commercial properties are often dissimilar. There are different ways to evaluate a commercial property. Residential properties have comps. I mean, almost always we can find comps. There's rare occasion that we can't find comparable properties to identify really what the price should be. So the cash on cash return and capitalization rate can be used in some residential situations, but primarily it's a commercial, a commercial thing. Yeah, the main thing to note here is that that point that Kim made that these measurements don't consider equity or appreciation. They don't consider the fact that you're paying off a mortgage and building equity in that property. And the market is also increasing over time, which is giving you further equity through appreciation. Neither of these measurements take that into consideration. So we don't consider them a good analysis tool for a residential buy and hold property. Okay, let's talk a little bit about market conditions because uh, they're really, uh, really tight market right here. So if you look at, at the left-hand side, you can see our price ranges. We look at $100,000 price bands. And the, the next uh, column in called active listings, you can see just how low the inventory is. This is for the three-county area of Altagamy, Winnebago, and Calumet counties. And so to, to really drive the measurement and how low it is, if you look at the yellow highlighted column called months of inventory and look at the point of reference down below, Right, seven or more months is a buyer's market, six to seven months is a neutral market, and less than six months is a seller's market, which means there's more buyers than there are homes. Now, what is a month of inventory? So if we say we have one month of inventory in any one of those price bands, what that means is if that no other uh, properties came on the market in that price, within one month, all of the properties that are currently on the market would be gone. So now to put that in perspective, if you look at the um, the zero to ninety, zero to one hundred thousand dollar band. The first one there, 0.27 months, or roughly a quarter of a month of inventory. Basically, what that's saying is, if that nothing else came on the market within one week, everything would be gone. Now scroll down to the two hundred to three hundred dollar range, three hundred thousand dollar range, 0.11. That's a third of that, right? So we're talking days of inventory. So this is how tight the market is right now. Uh, these stats were as of uh, the first of this month. Um, however, you know, it, it really points out the fact that we've got to be careful because we're in a highly competitive market and we've got to watch what we do when we're buying as an investor. And Kim will talk a little bit more about that uh, in just a bit. Yeah, you know, the one thing I want to also share there is, you know, yes, we do have to be careful with the competition and don't overspend. The good news is if last year, year over year, we got 10% appreciation, the expectation is high for this year too, I'll show you. Sometimes you put yourself in a really beautiful position because of that. So these statistics are actually compiled by lots and lots of resources. And at the very end of this presentation, we'll be able to show you some of the resources 
Um, this comes from Keeping Current Matters, who uses the stats from almost every source in the United States that's reputable. So this is a compilation of really good information if you want to go to Keeping Current Matters and see some of the things they have. We pay for their slides on a monthly basis because they give us all kinds of good information and real estate changes on a monthly basis. So here we see the months of inventory of home sales. And as you can see, last year they were up you know, a little bit, but gosh, 2.6 months of inventory is low, low, low. I mean, six or seven is neutral. And we usually are in a buyer's market having eight or more months of inventory. And then as we go farther down from last year, all the way through to December, inventory is very low. Not unusual that we have lower inventory in December, but very unusual that it's this low. And it has stayed low cons consistently. I see it moving up a little bit um, recently, but not by much. Then we look at the mortgage rates and we see that mortgage rates are actually have been low for the whole 21st century. I mean, the average, if you go back 50 years, maybe even 100 years is 8.6 to 8.8% is the average interest rate for, for a residential mortgage. So even at 3.76%, we are doing extraordinarily well. <laughs> That's a really good interest rate. And we're probably going to see a couple more uh, upward movements this year. I suspect we will. It's time to kind of release that and let it go back to the market evaluating that and not the government policies making the decision on how, how that's all going to work. But boy, I think for the next year or two, we probably have a really good place when it comes to uh, really good opportunities when it comes to the mortgage rates. The next couple of slides are showing us a few things. One is about change in price and the other is buyer traffic. And you can see that in the whole country, buyer's traffic is pretty, pretty strong, right? We have very strong in certain areas and either stable or strong in most other areas. Now, last year it was strong or very strong in all areas. And they're telling us that, you know, maybe things are stabilizing off, stabilizing off a little bit for some people. In Wisconsin and the Fox Valley, we're not seeing that. We put a couple of properties on the market at mid price uh, last week, and both of them together had 60 showings, 30 offers, and we got over $50,000 over asking. So, it's really strong right now. The traffic is strong. So you're going to have high competition as an investor looking for some of those properties that are in a little bit less tidy condition will be very helpful to you. And we have the VIP vendor partners. We have all kinds of vendor partners, plumbers, electricians, handymen, remodelers, people, if you need resources, we can provide you with those resources. No problem. Um, people we know that are vetted that can help you out. Then you look at the change in home prices, right? We're looking all the way back to 2012. There was a pretty big steep change. Well, that was because we had gone way down in 2006 to eight. We actually lost value. Our properties lost value through that mortgage meltdown. And then they started to move up, 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 up. We had to get back to a reasonably normal position. Now, on average, you're going to have about two and a half to 3% um, appreciation per year in residential real estate. And we lost all that value. We went down. Now we have to kind of make it up. If we had just been doing that two to two and a half percent, we would be at about the same price point we are now. So we're not in a bubble. Don't worry about that. Doesn't mean things won't change in the future, but right now we're not in that position. You can see though that year over year, there was a pretty steep increase. And I was saying here was about 10%. The next slides are going to tell us what the predictions are. So the forecast talks uh, is many, many different companies. These are larger corporations. NAR, you see as the National Association of Realtors. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are the largest purchaser of home mortgages. So they are highly invested in doing the statistical analysis and know what's going on. And they're all the way from 9% to 3%. People say you're going to have appreciation. In our market, we're probably going to be somewhere in that 5 to 7% this year. Um, it's looking pretty steady across the board that that's where we'll end up overall. If you look at the right graph, they're talking about the increases in rents and rents have been increasing just like crazy. I mean, it's amazing. People are buying a rental property. It's currently rented at $700 and rental meter, which we'll talk about later, tells us we can get $1,100. So the new owner is going to significantly increase that rent, probably um, allow the, uh, the current renter out of their month to month rent. They'll give them their 30 notice and find somebody else who will pay them a, a lot more money. Purchasing today is a much better idea for everybody than renting. Renting is extremely expensive. And the only reason we should really be renting is because we're there short term. Um, maybe we had a foreclosure or uh, we had a bankruptcy. Or we haven't done the right things to build our credit or we've allowed our credit to deteriorate. So that's what you're gonna have to keep in mind when you're looking for renters. If someone has a 720 credit score, they've got enough money for 10% down and they plan to stay at their job for two years, they're going to be buying and not renting. So you're going to have credit scores that are a little lower. You're probably going to have 
um, less income for some of these people, they, or, in the, or they don't have as much in the bank and they don't have the capability right now to buy, which is why they're choosing to rent. So we're gonna give you some really good ideas on how to find the, the diamonds in the rough there. Now we're gonna talk about locating properties and we're just gonna talk about the three basic methods. There are, of course are thousands, right? But we're gonna talk about the three that we see most people um, traditionally using. Working with the realtor is number one. And the benefit to working with the realtor is as a buyer, you don't pay any commissions. So there's a lot of value there. If you can find somebody who knows the investment in inventory, who understands investment properties, recognizes how to deal with the lenders and has some time to work for you. Um, they can also connect you directly to the multiple listing systems almost everywhere in the country today that's available definitely here in the northeastern wisconsin area it's available that way you're getting real-time data when a new home comes on the market that might be a potential for you and matches your criteria it'll pop into your inbox so you can take a look at it and see if you're interested in it or not because in some cases if we don't go and see the property that day or maybe the next morning we won't even have an opportunity to write an offer someone will already have written an offer and it will be accepted or you can look at for yourself. There's all kinds of places to do that, right? Zillow, Trulia, Estately, I mean, Realtor.com, LoopNet is a commercial real estate MLS, and they're not, they're not as highly regulated as residential. So they're not as accurate either, but they do give good, good information. And it's only partial information in LoopNet. The commercial realtors actually pay for a LoopNet subscription, so they get all the information. They make some of that information available to the public, um, and that would be on the LoopNet site that you and I could go see if we don't have a subscription. The third way is what we call third party, and actually Zillow, Trulia, Stately, they are all third party vendors too, and, and, and also you see Mash Visor, Realty Track, um, Redfin, there's a whole bunch of them out there. The third party is not a member of the multiple listing system. They're not a member of the Realtors Association, so they have to purchase their data from another source. Typically, their data is a little bit older. It sometimes isn't scrubbed, um, but it can be fun to go out there and look. You can see you know, everything that's going on, and, and people will put in their criteria into those sites as well just to see what's out there. Beware that in this heavy-duty seller's market, roughly 85% of the properties that are currently on those, those uh, third-party sites are already under contract, and they're not telling you that. They're not telling you that because they need eyes on their sites, and if you knew everything was under contract, you probably would go look there. So beware, just beware of that. The best thing for you to do is get on the CoLab session, CoLab site um, with a realtor so you get real-time data and then use these as your backups. Analyzing properties. We've got a couple of simple ways to kind of take it to that next step. So you go, okay, well, I have 10 properties here that all I have interest in. All of them might be an opportunity, but I don't really want to spend an hour on 10 different properties. How do I figure this out? We have a couple of what we call rules that we're going to discuss. And the first one is the easiest one. We call it the 1% rule. So if I'm going to purchase a property for $200,000, I should get $2,000 in rent on average. Now you can go a little below and some properties are a little above, you know, it's really up to you and your risk factor. But in general, I'm looking at this when I say, oh gosh, this particular property has two people renting it with the long-term lease. It's not up till next year. They're each renting for $700 and they want me to pay $200,000 for this property. I might end up paying two twenty five dollars actually, if I really want to get it. The 1% rule is not in alignment and it's probably not a good idea. 2% rule is primarily for properties that are, aren't in very good condition or the location isn't great, right? So I'm, I have a property that I know I'm gonna have to put a lot of money into over time. Then I better get 2% of what I pay for it in rent because I'm gonna have things I need to buy. Maybe I need to put on a new roof or I need to recite it or it needs new windows, um, updated doors, You know, who knows, flooring all needs to be replaced. When, those, when that's the condition, you wanna do those things as quickly as you can or over time, but you might wanna use the 2% rule for those more dilapidated properties. And then this is for all properties. The 50% rule is focused on, I wanna make sure that my operating expenses are at least, are less than rather 50% of what I'm getting in rent. And that excludes your mortgage. So take your mortgage out of the picture, look at all your expenses, and then look at what I'm getting for rent. And if what my expenses exceed 50%, then this isn't a good property for me. We're looking at forward and backward projections when we're talking about this as well. In other words, if I know that I'm gonna to have to invest a pretty significant amount of money in the near future on this property, then that's gonna weigh into that 1% rule. Well, I'm gonna to have to get these big expenses if I put those in play, um, am I gonna be able to, to get good return on investment? The opposite is true as well. So we bought a property uh, on Viola a couple of years ago, I think now, 
and it had brand new windows. It was newly insulated, it had new siding, a new roof, new air conditioning unit. So there were all the big, big ticket items were all replaced. So we thought, Hey, you know, we're looking forward on this one. We're not going to have to worry about it. We can actually go a little below that 1% and it's not risky for us to do that. All of these rules really take in most importantly, condition and maintenance. What am I going to have to do to fix it and keep it in good shape? And what's the current condition or location of the property um, when making these analyze, when doing this analyzing and making an attempt to decide if this is a good property to go deeper on, drill deeper down. Yeah, Kim's right with the, these are rules of thumb and, you know, really the 1%, 2% rule really based on the condition of the property and how much money you're going to have to sink into it short term and then further out for deferred maintenance. Um, the the 50% rule, I would just want to point you out there that uh, the the big swing in the 50% rule in operating expenses is property taxes. And what you'll find is in different municipalities, they have different rates of property taxes and, and that will swing that 50% um, higher or lower depending on, on where you're actually purchasing property. So keep that in mind. Looks like we've got a chat out here. When you want to count for taxes when creating rent charge as well. Yes, absolutely. We'll show you how to do that in just a second. Yeah, Brian's gonna give you a good example. And this example, it goes he goes by pretty quickly. So listen carefully, maybe take notes. We also have these slides available if you want them. Okay, so let's talk about return on investment. Before I, I, we talked about that we were focused on cash, right? We wanna make sure that we have good cash flow coming in and that we have good appreciation value. So if we add the cash flow that we make and the appreciation that we get from the market and the increase in equity that we generate from paying down our mortgage, our principal mortgage, the three of those components combined against what we've got invested in the property is what we call our return on investment. And uh, that's what we'll look at next. Oh, slide. There we go. Okay, so I've got an, an example here. and. What this example shows is purchasing the property in a traditional finance method under a mortgage on one side and purchasing it with cash on the other side. And I'll explain why we wanna look at these two different scenarios as we go through it. But basically we're looking at a, a basic income statement. At the top here, we saw how much we're gonna pay for the property, 169,200. Uh, on the finance side, we have a down payment of 25%. Uh, we paid some mortgage points to get a better rate. And let's say we have $9,300 in refurb expenses to get it up to, to code and ready to rent. So the total investment here is 53206 Now on the cash side, I've got the same purchase price, but I'm essentially making 100% down payment. I um, have li limited closing costs. I'll have the same refurb expenses. But I've got a significant amount more in cash invested up front, 100, 180000 roughly. Now let's look at the income statement part of it, the revenue and the operating expenses. So the, the rent per month, we're gonna say we can get 1600 and we determine that via rentometer. And Kim will talk a little bit more about that tool in a bit. Um, the mortgage, we understand the mortgage payment because it comes directly from the amortization schedule. Uh, the taxes per month, we can look at what the taxes were last year and then divide by 12 um, and get a monthly cost for that. Insurance, you can get a quote from, uh, from your insurance agent. Uh, so that those are really hard fixed costs that you can use in your analysis. Now, maintenance gets a little bit more murky because you don't know what you don't know in terms of maintenance. And so we use in this analysis $300 a month. Uh, and then as you go through time, you can adjust that based on your actuals. But I think $300 a month at a $1,600 a month um, rental property is probably pretty conservative. The next thing we looked at here is occupancy risk. And we talked about that before. We, we are assuming that uh, on average, we're gonna have one month of vacancy uh, as we go through time. So if we have an annual lease and the, the renter leaves after the year, we will go in there, do some painting, fix the floors or whatever we're gonna do, but it's gonna sit vacant for a month is what we're planning into our model. Now the annual cash flow, take a look at that. Uh, 11 months of revenue, because we assume one month of, of vacancy minus our operating expenses gets us to that number Kim talked about EBITDA, right? So this is cash basis. There's no depreciation or amortization in here. So we've got about $3,500 annual cash flow. Now, if we look at the equity side of things, because we talked about equity and appreciation and cash flow. So we have 3,500 3, roughly in cash flow. If we look at the equity, we had uh, 53,000 in the initial investment that we have in the property. We paid down 2,600 roughly in our uh, our principal balance on our mortgage. So now we have total 
uh, in invested capital of 55,800. So now let's talk just briefly about this cash on cash return, which we said we don't utilize uh, during a, a residential analysis. It's, it's taking my EBITDA uh, divided by my total cash investment, not including uh, equity increase, right? And I get 6.52% and per our percentages, okay, so it falls in line, but what does it really tell us? Because it's not in including uh, equity and appreciation. All right, further down, pre-tax cash return on investment. We have our cash flow. We have our appreciation, and you'll notice I use 3% here as a annual appreciation, and Kim was telling us that it's 10%. If I do that, holy cow, we really get a big number there, right? So I'd like to be conservative in my analysis, and so I'll use 3% because that's historically what the average would be, and that would bring me about $5,000 year over year. Then the equity increase again, we showed that before, about $2,600 in terms of the principal balance that you paid down. So now your total cash investment, uh, divided by your total cash investment rather, is 20% return on investment. That's pretty darn good. I don't know where else you're, you're going to find that kind of return. Now, comparatively, if I look over at the cash uh, purchase side, I have my, you know, my 180000 that I, I initially laid out. My cash flow is a little higher because I don't have a mortgage payment. My appreciation is the same, estimated at that 3% but I've only got an 8.38% return on investment. Okay, you say, well, maybe that's not so good. Well, it depends on your investment strategy because if I look down a little bit lower here at equity and available credit, um, if my strategy is to take credit, uh, take the value out of my existing properties and continue to invest in further more properties, right? If I look at the one that I financed, I started out with my remaining debt of 124,000 roughly, my total equity, that I have, and I have a loan to value ratio. And the loan to value is when you have a property and you have equity in it, and you wanna borrow against that equity, the bank is only gonna give you up to 75% of that equity. And we call that loan to value. So if I have a loan to value percentage of 75%, in this particular case, the available amount that I have to use as credit is $5,700 compared to the cash side of the equation where I have 130,000 available. So it really just depends on what your investment strategy is and as to how you want to, you know, purchase these properties going forward. And there's a whole bunch of different options in between these two, right? So uh, you, uh, talk to your lender, talk to your tax advisor and so on uh, to figure out which one. Finally, I want to talk about the 1% the and the 50% rule that we, that, that Kim just presented. So we have rent of 1600. Um, our purchase price with all the cash involved is 180,000. Our, uh, our, Resultant here is 0.89%, not quite 1%, but you know, that's a rule of thumb. It's, you know, we're pretty close at pretty close at 0.89. Now the 50% rule, we have $634 in operating expenses, again, excluding the mortgage and watch for the taxes divided by our monthly rent is 39.62%, which is below 50%. So I look at this property and I go, this is at least worth continuing to look at in terms of a potential purchase. Okay, Kim, let's talk about purchasing the property. Yep, got to buy something if we're going to get a return on investment, right? <clears throat> there's representation. There's a variety of ways to represent, be represented when you're buying a property. Um, the first one is working with your realtor. I'm going to get into detail about it in, in just a minute. There's several ways that you can be represented with a realtor as well. So there's different types of representation. Attorneys uh, all in the state of Wisconsin all have a, a Wisconsin real estate license. Most of them are not members of the association, and they're, so they're not real tours, right? They don't have access to the MLS. However, um, attorneys definitely can draft uh, offers or review offers, those kinds of things, because um, all of them have that license. They have that Wisconsin license. You can work with a for sale by owner. So you can pick up a property that someone is selling independently without representation, and you can just choose to write your own offer and present your own offer, lay it out there on the table. Now, people who have been doing, uh, been in the real estate business a long time may occasionally do that. Most of them, actually, we have several investors that are like that. They just basically call us up and tell us exactly what they want us to write on the offer because from their perspective, they just want our risk assessment. They want to make sure they're paying the right price for the property. And um, they want to make sure that we identify anything that and a cursory inspection that we think might be wrong with it so that they can uh, utilize those resources. But basically, they don't have representation. So with a realtor, 
this is kind of a unique situation and it's not in every state, but it is here in Wisconsin. When a realtor takes you through a property, if that, if that realtor and you have not signed a contract to be in business together, you, the realtor actually represents the seller. The seller pays our commissions and so you represent the seller. Now, if you want representation, you want someone to provide you with skill and opinions and give you the tools that you need to succeed at the highest level, you want to sign something called agency. It's, it's a relationship thing, right? It's a disclosure that tells who's going to pay who for what, what you're actually looking for, where you're actually looking for it. Um, there's a variety of, of informational pieces that says this is what that realtor is required to do for you. Uh, so they need to bring their skills, their talent, their tools, um, their vendor partners, uh, their opinions, and then, of course, identifying pricing and, and those types of things, maybe negotiating um, in a powerful way to help you to win, be the one over the 20 other offers that wins the deal. The attorney can do everything that the realtor can do from that perspective when it comes to writing the offer and moving all those things together. What we're finding in this marketplace is it costs a lot more money to use an attorney because typically you're writing more than one offer before you get accepted. So in a standard market, right? Somebody writes an offer, you negotiate back and forth, you either come to terms or you don't, right? In this market, there may be five or six offers, maybe even 10 or 20. In that case, the person, the, the uh, person looking for the properties goes and sees four or five properties, has their attorney write an offer, and then that doesn't get accepted. And they do it again and again and again until finally they get their offer accepted. So it can be a pretty pricey situation in this, in this uh, market. However, there's many a time when someone says, I really want my attorney to review this and make sure that my risk is calculated properly. Working with for sale by owners, I always caution people, um, if, if I would have thought about being a realtor 20 years ago, which it was right before 20 years that I became one, but I hadn't even thought of it at that point. Um, I wouldn't have thought twice about buying a property for sale by owner would have been no problem. Why not? What's the difference? And now that I know all the laws, all the risk, all the different things that are involved, all the rules, everything that, that you have to you know and understand, I would really be careful about buying a for sale by owner without some type of representation, either an attorney or a realtor to help you out. And most for sale by owners are really... Welcome to the negotiation. I mean, we sell a lot of properties with for sale by owners and they, they pay our, our commission all the time. They don't care. They pay the commission. They want the help too. When they realize what, what there's all involved, they want the help as well. And then again, you can have no representation. You can just do it yourself. That's legal in the state of Wisconsin. Now, how do I raise capital? What do I do in order to be able to buy a property? You'd be surprised how many people have very little or no money invested in, in properties who are high level investors. The traditional mortgage is just the opposite of that. A traditional mortgage would be, I go to the bank, I get a pre-approval, and I'm going to use a simple conventional mortgage to buy this property. Just note, you're going to need 20 or 25% down in almost every case if you have a traditional mortgage. And there's nothing wrong at all with leveraging money. In a lot of cases, it's the right thing to do is to only pay 20% of that. And then you can go buy another property and another property and another property rather than pay for the whole thing in cash. So a lot of times leveraging money is your biggest advantage when it comes to the real estate investment business. Cash flow, maybe you own a couple of properties and you're making money on those properties. So you can take the cash that you've made and use your cash flow and invest it in additional properties. Hard money, there's a variety of ways to, to work with hard money. Um, a lot of flippers or short-term investors will go to a, someone who has a lot of cash. They'll offer them a certain amount of points up front in order to be able to have that money released. The interest is usually quite a bit more, but if it's for short-term and it's calculated into your return and the, and the numbers work, no problem. I mean, we see it all the time. Flippers will go to a hard money lender because it's quicker and they don't have to go through all the closing costs, et cetera. So they will... Now pay them 2% up front, two points up front and pay 10% interest, but it's only for six months. And ultimately they end up making good money when they get the property sold. So it all works out. Line of credit, traditionally, we hear that line of credit as a home equity line of credit. Now there are multiple ways to do this. Many people will buy one or two investment properties. They'll do well on them. They'll be able to show that they're doing well on them by producing their financial statements to the bank. And the bank may simply give them a line of credit, a $50,000, $100,000, $200,000. In some cases where people are investing in many properties and they've been able to prove that they're a low risk and that they're successful at doing that, they may get a $2 million dollar line of credit so they can go pay cash for a variety of properties. Um, and then ultimately, I mean, it looks like cash to the, to the buyer. Ultimately, they're then going to pay back those loans. They tend to be commercial loans and they tend to have a little higher interest rate, but there again, that's all figured into the investment calculation. And if you have still have a good return on investment, it's worth it.
And the last one is a self-directed IRA. You can use your IRA money in some cases to make purchases or real, you do real estate investments. I would highly suggest though that you work with your CPA and your financial planner if you're gonna do that because there's a significant number of rules around it. We were all excited about buying an Airbnb and um, we we're gonna rent it out you know, most of the time and go use it two or three times and uh, have somebody else clean it, but maybe fix it up and get it ready so that it would be in good shape and we'd be able to get premium rents. We found out that with the self-directed IRA dollars invested, you can't touch it, you can't use it, and you can't participate in it. So there's a lot of rules that's around that self-directed IRA. Things we need to take into consideration in today's market is the multiple offer environment. So a lot of times when we're purchasing properties or considering purchasing properties for our investors, the investor will go through the property with us. We'll do a really solid inspection. They have identified what risk they're willing to take. Are they going to have an inspection or not? Going to have an appraisal or not? Things like that. And they say, okay, I like this property. I'm interested. And maybe we have four days. There's four days worth of showings on this property. Then all offers are presented at a particular time. And then they're reviewed at a particular time and one is selected. Well, well, we'll hold off usually in those situations for two or three, at least two days, usually three days to see how many offers that uh, owner, that seller is actually getting. We just did this on Monday. We hoped they, they in, intended to get you know five to 10 offers. They thought they were going to get five to 10 offers. In that case, we weren't even going to bid on it because we didn't want to bid that high. But our buyers recognized that there's only one good offer that they were going to counter. And he said, hey, I think I can probably do better than that one good offer. And so we walked through the property. He identified he liked it. And we did write an offer on that property then on Monday. Um, competition with owner occupied buyers. That's been a big issue for us right now. And what that means is there's a duplex, say, and one side is rented month to month and the other side is vacant. Well, in this, in this environment, you can find renters, you know, there's, they're everywhere. So you can pull renters out of almost anywhere and, and fill your building. But if I'm going to, uh, if I'm going to own this building and live in one side, really what I'm trying to do is offset my rent by renting the other side. So I'm probably willing to pay more than a typical investor would find would be lucrative. So keep that in mind. And, and we see it a lot. Um, I think it's just an attitude right now, just like wholesaling. It's an attitude that everybody should live in, a, in an environment where there's two or three other tenants. It gives me an opportunity to purchase a little bit more property. And then I just have to deal with a couple of renters. Well, I, you know, we look at that. I call those speculators. And most of those speculators in two, three years will be calling us up to sell those properties. So we're excited about it. I mean, you know, as you get into the rental business, you really have to have good systems in order to do it effectively. Pre-approval, we just want to quick let you know that pre-approval is required basically at this time if you want to put an offer on, on the table, um, especially when we have multiple offers, even though you know you're good for it, the seller doesn't always know you're good for it. In some cases, they won't even present the offer. Proof of funds is the same as a pre-approval, except it's for cash. So if I come and tell you, Mr. Seller, I'm interested in purchasing your property and I'd like to buy your property for $200,000. Maybe it was listed for 180 and I say, you know, I'm willing to pay 200, the numbers work um, and I've got cash. He wants to know that the bank agrees that I've got that cash. Otherwise he's not going to take my offer seriously because I could be making it up that I have that $200, right? So a proof of funds is something you want to go to your bank if you're going to pay cash and say, I need this letter on your letterhead with your signature so I can present it when the offer is presented to the seller. Earnest money is just your way of saying, hey, I'm serious about this property. I'm going to give you some money to, as kind of a, a payment to say, you keep this in earnest of me following through and closing on the property. And as long as you don't breach your contract, that will be credited back to you at closing. So it's, you're not giving it to them. You're handing it to them to say, I'm serious. I want to buy this, but you have things to do. You know, it has to go through title. Of course, there's some other things that may need to take place. Maybe you do have an inspection contingency. So you want to be able to put that earnest money in a trust fund. It needs to be in a trust fund legally in the state of Wisconsin. And if you follow through with the terms of the contract, it'll be credited back to you at closing. If you don't follow through with the terms of the contract, it may end up in the seller's hands. Appraisals are not um, assessments. They're not tax assessments. There's no relationship at all. Appraisals are fair market value. What a buyer will pay for the property today. So appraisers are highly trained. It takes two years to become an appraiser and they are licensed in the state of Wisconsin as well. They are gonna identify what the property is worth based on other properties that have sold that are comparables. Inspections are also 
performed primarily by licensed inspectors in the state of Wisconsin. In Wisconsin's offer to purchase, if you want someone else to do an inspection, you have to identify that specifically. Otherwise, it has to be a licensed inspector who goes through that home. They look at the condition of everything in the house, right? They're looking at the electrical, the HVAC, the roof, the walls. I mean, they're really taking a peek at just about everything. It takes about three hours. Average one's probably three seventy-five dollars to four hundred dollars at this time. And uh, inspectors don't tell you what to do about any of the problems. They're just telling you what problems you might have or what they see that's not up to code. Um, maybe is going to cause some problems down the line, things of that nature. But I will tell you, in the last two years, I think we've had six inspections total on all offers we've had um, uh, that were accepted, both the ones that we listed and our sellers accepted, or the offers that we've written that our buyers have gotten accepted. It is rare that you can have an inspection. So do a great cursory inspection. If the property is in, in damaged condition, in pretty bad condition, you might want to bring an inspector with you on the tour. And then, of course, we have different levels of ownership. So one way is to buy a property as a business entity, and, and that's preferred when you can. So if you have an LLC or if you don't have an LLC, if you can create an LLC to purchase a property, you have a lot, I call it like the brick wall between you and your personal things. If something happens, somebody falls down, um, you didn't maybe, um, the, the, you didn't stop a ridge on a sidewalk, somebody tripped, they really hurt themselves, <clears throat> excuse me, and they take you to court to sue you. They can only sue you as your business. They can only sue the business for what the business has as far as insurances or cash. If you purchase the property independently and you own it, they can also sue you for your personal things, things that are in your bank account or even your wages over time. So we try to keep our businesses in a, or our uh, properties in a business entity when we can. If you have a lender, if it's a traditional residential mortgage, you won't be able to do that. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac don't allow it. Um, and they only allow 10 properties or 10 mortgages at a time. So you could only have 10 to total of 10 mortgages. But most people buy their very first property personally. When they get into their second or third and they can produce some results, they can show I've been positively improving my wealth by owning this property. I'm doing a good job of managing it. And I picked out the right property. You can go and get a commercial loan. And oftentimes the commercial loans will allow you to put those properties in LLCs and then you have that protection. The note on the bottom says matters of ownership and property um, titling should always be reviewed with your attorney, your tax professional, the title company or a lender. And what they're saying there is there's different ways to take title and you really want to get advice on what way is best for you to take title when you are going to determine the ownership of a property. That's an investment. Okay. So now we've purchased the property. Uh, we now get to get, go ahead and lease the property and a couple of words here. You need to have a lease. Um, there are really some specific laws uh, and requirements by the state for your lease. Um, the website I've got there for the uh, Department of Agri Agriculture uh, Trade and Consumer Protection is a great uh, site. They have what's called on there the L Landlord Tenant Guide that you can make sure that your lease covers all of the requirements that are uh, put forth in the statutes of the state of Wisconsin. Um, resources for, for leases. You can get a whole bunch of different lease, leases together. You know, we, we work with a lot of investors. We look at their leases. Um, there's a lot, a lot of online resources. LegalZoom is a good one, Law Depot, uh, all over the internet. Uh, you can find them. You can get it from your attorney. Um, when we created our lease, I've got a background in contract. So I took a number of different leases that I had access to and just put together my own lease. And thought it was pretty good. And, and then I took it to my attorney and he kind of blew a couple holes in it. So it's really a good idea to spend the, you know, a couple hundred dollars is what it costs us to have the attorney re review that and make sure we're in compliance with the state code and that we're covered for everything that might uh, ensue. And especially with, with COVID when that hit, there was all kinds of different requirements um, and, and, you know, the, the moratorium on rent and all that kind of stuff that you want to make sure that you're, you're tightly covered. We've had situations in our in our environment. In fact, we had one last year where there was not a lease, and um, the tenant didn't want to leave when we were selling the house, and it was it got ugly after a little while. It finally worked out, but you don't want to put yourself in that position. Always uh, get a lease, get it reviewed by an attorney, spend a couple extra hundred dollars to do that, and it'll save you a lot of headache. Okay, leasing the property, determining how much rent. How do I how do I figure that out, right? We want to look at what's the current rent. Um, maybe the current rent is adequate. Uh, one of the 1% rule might help you with that. The 50-50 rule might help you with that. 
And there are a lot of tools. We use Rentometer. Okay. There's um, rent data at rentdata.org is a good place to look. Rentometer, I think it costs us 30 or $40 a year. And I use it all the time. I just go out and I pop in the address. So I'm looking at a property might be a potential. I pop in the address, how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms, how many square feet. And it's able to tell me 25%, what 25% of the properties around here are renting for, what's the median. It also can tell me if I have a really nice property in excellent condition, you know, I might be able to get that 75 percentile or maybe even at the top rent that's, that's possible out there. So I can look at what's reasonable for rent. That's been very helpful in, in putting us in the right position. There's also, um, when, when it comes to how do I find my tenant, advertising and screening are really important. And um, we use TurboTenant mostly, and that's been extremely helpful. TurboTenant allows you to be placed on about 25 different sites. So, and they show you where it's on Facebook and they show you where you got your tenants from, which I really like. There's a lot of online services to manage this entire process. In fact, it, we don't use TurboTenant for everything, but it uh, has leases on it. You can really use it to manage quite a bit of, of, of your um, applicant screening. Our recommendation is always get to know the tenants. So what we do is we put out their nine questions, they answer the questions, and we decide if we even want to invite them to an open house. We hold usually two, maybe three open houses. And then we invite them to those open houses. And if you are interested in actually applying and want to, want to actually uh, be a tenant with us, you've got to come to one of those open houses. I'm not going to rent to somebody. I don't know. That's just not going to happen. So they come to, to meet us. And then from the people who come to meet us, we evaluate, okay, who did we think would be our best tenant? Who do we get along with best? Who seemed to communicate most effectively? Who is open? Um, you have you can pick out your own values, your own values and your own criteria for how to determine who you actually want to ask to apply. And it costs forty five dollars to apply on Turbo Tenant, so we don't ask everybody to apply. We don't want them to waste their money if we're pretty sure we're not going to rent to them. We ask usually four or five people. They go out and they apply. We get credit scores. We get background um, checks. We get and they give you everything. It's very detailed. And then they also provide you. Uh, with their debt. So they tell you, uh, they show you he's got four credit cards or she's got four credit cards and they pay them all consistently and the balances aren't too high. Or we had one candidate that had like 11 credit cards. They were under 30 years old and had $140,000 in credit card debt. That's a really high risk. We didn't ask them to apply, you know, right? When they apply, don't be surprised that you get surprised. <laughs> We've had some of the people we think are going to be our best tenants and we get back the, the, uh, the, of uh, credit score and we get back the background check and it's not, they're not who we thought they were. So that happens quite a bit and just be prepared for it. Uh, in this environment, it's really easy to find tenants. The last time we had a vacant property, um, we just put it out on Turbo Tenant. They put it all over the place for us. And we had 48 people in less than a week that were had an interest in the property and came through open houses. They also port you to ads on Craigslist. Recently, we've identified there's a significant number of scams there. And so we, we back off because there's too many scams going on when it comes to that. Okay, now moving over to managing the problem, uh, property. I, I'm gonna tell you, this was probably the most scary thing for me when it came to investing. Um, you know, I had the nightmares of getting woke up at three in the morning to go over and unclog a toilet, those kind of things. Um, really, there's two different ways to manage the property. For maintenance, there's self-managed, right? You can do it yourself or you can have a bunch of connected resources. We, we have what we call our VIP referral group um, where we, uh, over the years of our real estate business, we've built a, a good connections with contractors of all different, uh, all different skills so we could use that. Um, property management company, you could do that as well. Um, they tend to be pricey. Um, they, they can do everything from the, the rental of the property, collecting the rents, doing the maintenance, or you, know, you choose what you want them to do but be careful on the cost of that. Um, VIP referral partners, like I told you, uh, that we've developed over time that we give to our clients as well. And home warranty, this, this is really what I would call a low cost insurance. The way home warranty works is that it covers your, your HVAC, your plumbing, your electrical, uh, you know, all that stuff that if you have a problem, you call them up, they, they find a, they find a um, contractor to come over and fix it. They charge you a, a trip fee of 75 to $100 and they fix the problem or they replace the component. So um, when we lived out in Hortonville, we had a home warranty on our home because our furnace was original from 1997. 
And I, w I would rather pay $100 uh, to, you know, if it, it finally had to be replaced, or pay $100 rather than 6000 for that. So we looked at it as sort of, sort of an insurance policy. Um, I will caution you that um, there are, there's a lot of different levels of capability of home warranty companies. We've used virtually, virtually all of them that are out there, and some of them really don't operate very well. Um, you know, some of them don't have the contractors connected to them, so they, they let you go ahead and uh, uh, define the contractor, call them over, get the problem fixed, and then you pay the contractor and they pay you back. It's a lot of paperwork. But it, 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 it is a good choice if you're, you don't have the connection with uh, VIP referral partners and you don't want to do the maintenance yourself. Home warranty is a good solution, at least when starting out. Yeah, all you got to do is reach out to us if you're thinking about a home warranty and say, this is one I'm thinking about buying. What do you think about it? And we'll give you our rating. A couple of them get zero. <laughs> so you don't want those. All right. Managing the property when it comes to collecting deposits and rents and all that kind of good stuff, right? The most important thing that you need to do is make sure that you have separate accounts from your personal accounts. All your rent money should go in a separate account. No, you don't have to get a business account that costs money for no reason. Just have a separate checking account or a separate savings account where everything goes in and comes out of. So you keep track of it all. Then your accounting and bookkeeping. Again, you want to have a separate account from your personal stuff. The best way to do that is have an accountant or a CPA do it on your behalf. If you're really good at accounting, especially if you only have one, no big deal. But if you start to have eight, 10, 12, it starts to become a lot of work. I mean, it takes you a lot of time and it's probably worth it just to pay somebody to do it. It will cost you pennies on the dollar compared to um, taking action on that yourself. Just keep it separate. And then items handled in the lease. You want to make sure that they have an understanding of what do they do when they have a problem? So the um, disposal in the kitchen broke and it won't work at all anymore. They need to know who to call, how to call them. Do I make a phone call? Do I text? Do I email? Is it Kim? Is it Brian? Is it Lindsay? You know, you want to make sure that that's clear and you should probably have it in writing somewhere um, just to protect yourself. So, and also to protect them um, if, if there's a problem, but making sure that they know this is how you do it. And if you have a problem, I want you to do it right away. Um, change requests, if there's anything that needs to be done differently, how are we going to communicate that? And again, everything, in my opinion, in our opinion, everything should be in writing. You got to be able to prove it if there's a problem. Um, renewals and terminations. So, so you get to decide once somebody's had a year lease and they've ended their term or they're close to ending their term, do you want them to stay or do you not want to ask them back? I mean, that's your option, right? And if you don't want to ask them back in this market, it's really easy to find additional renters. In some markets, it's not. So you want to really keep that in mind. Why don't I want to ask them back and what can I do to help them to be better tenants? Uh, also in termination, there's specific rules that surround the termination. So make sure that you have those things available to you, you know, just at your fingertips. You don't have to have them in your head. You just have to be able to go to it, read it, understand it before you go and do something like terminate um, somebody from, from their lease. Right of entry, when can you go in? What do you have to do to go into the property? I know a lot of people who own residential properties prefer to go pick up the rent um, or they have it uh, deposited in a Venmo or PayPal situation. And then they make a point of going back, going over to the property once a month, checking to make sure all the light bulbs are working properly, checking to make the make sure the smoke detectors and CO detectors are working properly, maybe three or four times a year changing the filter on the furnace. So you can put all that in writing too, and that this is how I'm going to handle that. And if you feel like your property is not going to need that or your tenant is going to be able to take care of that, you might just say, I want to be able to call you and within 24 hours have an opportunity to enter to observe. You know, put something in writing though. Um, property condition and dispute resolutions. Property condition, are they mowing the lawn? Are they taking care? I mean, is that part of the deal? Are they mowing the lawn and they said they would and you, it's in writing that they have to? Um, are they shoveling the snow or are, there, are they not shoveling the snow? And what are you going to do about that? So if, they, if it's in the lease that they're supposed to shovel the snow and they're not doing it, it should also be in the lease that you're going to hire someone and they're going to have to pay them. Make sense? All right, dispute resolutions. Um, that's usually through mediation. More often than not, uh, you're going to have somebody in mind that you would want to go to and say, we can't come to terms on this. So we both are going to have to come to you and have a discussion about how we're going to solve this problem. And again, I know I can't say this enough. If you have everything in writing, you might have it wrong. And you might have to admit that you have it wrong and move on, but then you can put it in writing for the next time. But if you don't have it in writing, the tenant is going to be right 97% of the time. So make sure that you've got everything in writing so they understand it and that you can go back and say, this is, it was written here. You saw it, you signed it, and I need you to take responsibility for it. 
So one last thing here we'll leave you with is um, just some helpful investing resources. Um, just FYI, if, if anybody wants to have a copy of these slides or wants my, um, my ROI calculator, my Excel ROI calculator, if, if we've invited you to this webinar, just reach out to us. If, if your agent has invited you and you're attending, please reach out to your agent and have them get in contact with us and we'll send the information to them and they can pass it forward to you. But um, the good book here, Millionaire Real Estate Investor uh, by Gary Keller, one of the founders of Keller Williams, the organization we work for, Keeping Current Matters, Kim uh, referenced that before, statistics from virtually everybody who's anybody in real estate statistics. And it's $25 a month, so it's cheap. month, so it's cheap. Yeah, Colab Center, that's connection directly to the MLS. Contact your realtor to get set up. Uh, the Landlord Tenant Guide again, lease resources. Wisco Rea is another one that we didn't bring up during the, uh, during the call here tonight, uh, but they're an organization that actually meet and they go through various different uh, topics on investment. That's what we were first introduced to uh, self-directed IRA. Uh, pretty good, pretty good organization. There is a subscription to that. Rental meter, I think we paid 40 or 50 bucks for that. Rent ranges for property, turbo tenant, uh, free to landlords, advertise and screen properties. And then here's some resources that we use. Uh, Jason for a uh, direct sales rep, a home warranty Inc. And his number there, Kristen Foster, who's our CPA. Uh, fantastic. She's the president of Fox Valley CPAs, Matthew Brummer. He's an attorney. Um, he's actually going to do a, an estate planning seminar next month for us that uh, you are, are welcome to join as well down at the Doubletree and Nina, and, and we can get that information out to you as well. And of course your realtor uh, is a good source of, of resource for investment. So with that, I'll, you know, we'll open it up for any questions. If you have some questions, chat them, chat them into the box there and we'll, we'll pick up on it. Yeah, I just wanna say one more thing. If, Go ahead. Um, I don't know, it doesn't sound like we're still on. Yeah. Um, if you are interested in getting the slides, Alejandro just did it. We know your email, Alejandro, but if you're interested in, in getting the slides, type your email in on the chat because we'll be able to see that we'll, uh, since this is being recorded. Or you can send it to me, Kim Batterman, K-I-M-B-A-T-T-E-R-M-A-N at kw.com. Or, or to their realtor. Yeah, if you come in here as a realtor, you definitely with with a realtor, if you've been invited, feel free to reach out to your realtor. Perfect. And then I also want to invite you to the estate planning. We're doing an estate planning clinic. Um, Matt is an estate planning uh, attorney, and he's been doing it for a little over a decade. He does a great job. And his intention is to teach us partly around our real estate. How can we, upon our death, transfer our real estate very, very quickly and easily without probate? That's a huge deal. And he's also going to talk about a variety of other things, but just that alone would be worth to attend, I think. It's April 19th from 5.30 to 7 at the Doubletree and Nina. And we do need to know if you're planning to attend. So somehow you got to get in touch with us and let us know. And then um, the last thing would be um, if you have questions that you didn't want to ask because you were nervous about it or you didn't think of them until later, you can come back to me again at Kim Batterman at kw.com or my number as Brian had listed there is 920-710-1710. I see quite a few people are typing in their email address so we can, we can get that taken care of. I'm writing some of them down right now. Anything you want to know that I need to know? Any questions at all? All right. Well, thank you guys for attending. We really appreciate you being here. We hope you benefited from this. We would also appreciate any feedback that you have, things that you thought were great in the presentation, things that maybe we should add to the presentation. Um, anything you want to give us as feedback, we're wide open to that. Thanks for being a part. We appreciate you. Don't turn it off. I'm writing down your email addresses. <laughs>